You are listening to MCC Votes and Seats, the podcast series of the Center for Political Science of Matthias Corvinus Collegium. We provide election insights with experts and politicians. This time, we are going to talk about the local elections in Croatia that were held on the 16th and the 30th of May 2021. Our guest expert is a political scientist, Dr. Vyshaslav Raus, who specializes in comparative politics, electoral systems, and party competition. Mr. Raus completed his doctorate in comparative politics at the Faculty of Political Science of the University of Zagreb, where he currently serves as assistant professor. Mr. Raus is the author of numerous high-standard scientific and professional papers. So, Mr. Raus, it is great to have you with us. Thank you for accepting our invitation. Thank you for having me here. So as to start, in the second half of May, of the four largest Croatian cities, three were acquired by the leftist and the liberal camp. In Zagreb, almost 70% of the vote went for the neo-leftist Tomislav Tomasevic, making him the 54th mayor of the capital city. Since 1992, power has swung between the conservative ruling Croatian Democratic Union, HDZ, and the Social Democrats. SDP. However, these parties gained weak results in the major cities compared to their former performances. Nevertheless, Prime Minister Andrei Plenković, leader of the ruling conservative HDZ, claimed absolute victory for his party after the HDZ won 15 out of 20 county prefectures. This edition of the MCC Votes and Seats podcast seeks to understand if the mayoral victories will have effects well beyond the big city's borders throughout the country. I suggest to go through Croatia's larger political parties and platforms that achieved considerable results results in the ballot. Mr. Raos, would you please name some of these parties? On the one hand, uh, we had changes in all four major cities, but this was also because all four seats were vacated. So the mayor of Zagreb, he died of a heart attack in February. The mayor of Osijek, he went into retirement. And also the mayor of Rijeka and the mayor of Split had some health issues and decided not to run for a second term. But on the other hand, we saw great competition and many new parties and candidates in the bigger cities. We have the Croatian Democratic Union, which is a very loyal member of the European People's Party. And especially uh, the prime minister used to be a member of the European Parliament and uh, always uses these connections with the um, European People's Party to show his competence and show Uh, why he is the best person to lead the country. On the other hand, the Social Democrats, which are also pro-European, but somewhat skeptical about uh, some of the government policies regarding the European Union. For example, the government wants to introduce the euro in the foreseeable future. However, uh, the Social Democrats and other opposition parties are a bit skeptical whether this is maybe too quick for the creation economy, for the prices, for uh, small businesses, etc. And uh, local elections are usually seen as midterm elections, that you, you're you sort of voting for your mayor, but you're also voting on the government. The Croatian Democratic Union does not have absolute majority in parliament. It is supported by a range of smaller parties, including ethnic minority parties, but also two smaller liberal centrist parties. So one of those parties is, is actually very strong in the north of the country. And there it was directly in competition with the Croatian Democratic Union. And they said in the coalition agreement that, you know, local politics, everyone is on their own. It is 15 county uh, prefects that were endorsed, supported by HDZ. But two of them were actually not members of HDZ. But those were coalitions where HDZ was the biggest party, but they supported some local candidates, some of them are non-party members. It is a a victory for them because in uh, the northern part of the country, which usually used to vote left. So uh, mostly if you look at Croatia, you'll see that uh, the the conservative parties are always stronger in the eastern parts of the country and southern parts of the country, which tend to be, of course, more traditional, but uh, which were also devastated by war. Whereas the richer parts of the country uh, in the West and in the North, and of course the capital also, uh, were not so, so much affected by the war. And at least until today, used to vote mostly for left and center-left parties. It is similar to some countries like in Poland. You can see that Western parts tend to vote more centrist or liberal, and Eastern parts are more national and conservative. Thank you very much for this historical and uh, cultural background and international comparison. 
How do you think the local elections change the balance of power as far as party politics in Croatia is considered? We can look at it at several levels. The one level is we look at the government party, at the prime minister's party, HDZ, and their main competitors, the social democrats. In this sense, HDZ is the clear winner because SDP, uh, the social democrats, are still in crisis. They have a new, quite uh, young leader, but he has not managed to, to actually unite people in his party. And we saw a catastrophic result for them, especially in Zagreb and especially in Split. For more than a decade, the social democrats dominated Zagreb. And the mayor, Bandic, who died, he used to be social democratic leader. But then he split with his party because he chose to run for president against the official candidate of the Social Democrats. And then, you know, the mayor founded his own party and started getting into coalitions with different actors, including the the, the Christian Democrats. But then, on the other hand, if you look at the Christian Democrats and their competitors from the right, so new forces, um, which might be more Eurosceptic, sometimes even more conservative in terms of some policy issues, For example, in Croatia, abortion become important in recent years. And many Catholic lay NGOs, they are now strongly connected to some of these newer conservative parties. And they actually, they don't criticize that much the left. They do. But they also criticize the Christian Democrats because they claim they're not very you know, strong on this issue. This new homeland movement, this is the strongest of those parties. They always say they are sovereignist. In that sense, we can see some parallels in terms of uh, communication with Fides uh, and also with peace. Until recently, Croatia was very much pro-EU in a sense that it's not even debated. And now we do have some Eurosceptic voices, although these Eurosceptic voices are still very much interested in European development funds, and they do criticize the government also for that, for not doing enough. The third level is, of course, what is happening on the left. Big news is this Green Left Coalition, which is modeled not after the Green Party of Germany, but more after Podemos in Uh in Spain. It combines um, some ideas about, you know, municipal uh, socialism in terms of, you know, organizing people on a local level around um, public space and, and public ownership. And then, of course, also environmental issues. Plus, there's a third thing which was very important for them to gain votes in Zagreb, And this is uh, the anti-corruption agenda against HDZ, which had a lot of corruption scandals, but also against other parties which were in power, like this former social democrat in Zagreb running the city. The green left is eating away votes from the social democrats, but it's also mobilizing younger people who have not voted earlier. But we can also say that for these um, more conservative new parties, that they also attract new voters. You can really see in local elections that uh, even with with the pandemic, we did have some campaigning uh, on the street, you know, a stall in in a public square, just a couple of people, but they talk to, you know, to passersby, they distribute some leaflets, some classical campaigning with billboards. Actually, TV campaigning was very weak. I mean, it's usually not that strong for local elections. For example, local media will rely on print media and a local radio station. It was more about some debates between the candidates and not direct, you know, campaign spots that we used to see often. Talking about these technical solutions of the campaign, did you see any difference between the party's activities? One difference was that it's always the city government that have to approve if any person, not just for, for elections, uh, wants to, you know, register a big event in, in, a, in a big public square. Now, of course, they could not do it because there are still restrictions on how many people can gather in public. Although I should stress that in Croatia, measures against the pandemic have been quite liberal in comparison to other countries. Mm, even if parties wanted to actually gather more people, they could have done it, but they did not uh, you know, officially have these big happenings in, in, in a public square. That was the main difference. But they still retained this very important aspect of campaigning. The Green Left, for example, is, is very serious about the, the measures. Was the pandemic an integral part of the campaign of the parties? Mm, not necessarily. Some, there are some newer very economically liberal parties. One of them is called Focus, and it actually won some mayoral positions in some smaller but very business-friendly towns around Zagreb. And there they talked about restrictions because they talked to entrepreneurs. 
and how they were affected by restrictions. But in the case of Zagreb, for example, the earthquake and, and rebuilding was much more important. Thank you for describing all the technical details of the elections. But now, remaining in Zagreb, the Croatian capital, after 21 years, will be led by a new mayor. Since 2000, Zagreb has been governed by Milan Bandic, an independent, non-partisan mayor. However, he died unexpectedly of a heart attack earlier this year. His success in the otherwise traditionally leftist liberal capital was due to the fact that he pursued a populist policy whose essence was to satisfy the needs of every stratum, group and ideological camp. Thanks to the generous subsidies, Bandic could count on the support of all major social organizations, including those of the church and the partisan veterans. Yes, you are correct. He was he was really a person that managed to uh, cater to everyone's needs. However, when he died, you know there was some you know legal processes against him. As you said, he was very generous in giving you know uh, city money for many church purposes because he knew that people would love that. One day you would see him in a pilgrimage, in a procession, you know, being the first one to carry uh, a large cross. And then on the next day, he would be meeting some people and he had a badge with, with Tito's picture. So he managed to be everything at the same time. He would finance um, the Zagreb Pride, but then he would also, you know, finance an anti-abortion uh, the activism. And that's one of the reasons why this huge victory of the Green Left in Zagreb and Tomasevich. So some people, of course, voted for them because they want more green policy or more um, social policy, or they want uh, leftist policy because they think that the social democrats in Croatia have moved towards uh, more, you know, middle way liberal positions like Tony Blair, you know, in the 90s, how, you know, the, the labor in, in Britain, you know, moved from classical social democracy to more, you know, social liberalism. But then at the same time, you know, green issues are becoming more important. What will be very challenging for them is the financial situation that was left by this previous lavishly spending and often corrupt uh, local government. We're talking about projects which um, cost a lot of money, but they are you know, not really efficient. We have a new cable car going from the outskirts of Zagreb to the, to the hilltops, which became you know, so overpriced. And uh, now it's actually oversized. It looks like a cable car for a ski resort. If you come to Zagreb, you'll see that uh, it's not such a big mountain. Imagine building a large tunnel somewhere in the middle of Hungary where it's flat. You know, for some reason, you need a tunnel. One thing is, sure, Bandic was a very interesting politician, an entertainer. But yes. now let's, let's discuss this new wave on the left in Zagreb. So the uh, 39-year-old Tomislav Tomasevic could count on both social democratic and uh, leftist liberal votes, as you mentioned. Yes. This uh, movement he's leading was founded in uh, 2017 when a pro-city mm-hmm. activists joined forces with uh, Marxist, feminist, Titoist and uh, green organizations in a formation called Zagrad for the city in English. By 2020, a political platform named Mojemo, which means possible or we can, had formed around uh, the Zagrad movement, which became the fourth largest actor uh, in the National Assembly. In the second round, Tomasevich ran against Miroslav Škoro, the president of the far-right homeland movement. Škoro turned the elections to ideological battles, accusing Tomasevich and the Mojemo platform of wanting to revive Yugoslavia. At the end, Tomasevich won 68% of the vote. Consequently, more than two-thirds of the voters stood for a new Green left is turn, and uh, Mojemo now has a majority at the Zagreb City Hall, but is likely to form a coalition with the Social Democrats. So, Mr. Raus, would you tell us a bit about the Mojemo platform? On one level, uh, yes, it consists of uh, people who are very active in green NGOs and human rights NGOs, LGBT rights NGOs. The other level is many, you know, professors from um, different faculties, including my faculty. The third level is why they were so strong. First, Tomasevich really, although he's very young, he knew more about local, you know, urban issues than other competitors. Uh, the second thing is that they managed to really connect with citizen groups in, in every part of the cities. They managed to attract a lot of people who just saw the other candidate, Koro, as 
too nationalist or not uh, competent about local issues or someone who is not authentic because he used to be in the Croatian Democratic Union in the 90s and now is their biggest critic and you know acts as as he has nothing to do with them plus some of the people around him uh, used to be in the city government under bandage Tomasevic managed to also you know send out this message to the citizens, even those that, that might not necessarily want green politics or, or leftist politics, but want some change from bandage and want a clear start, a new anti-corruption agenda, younger people, they should vote for him. And then Shkora was accusing him of not being honest about these so-called leftist issues, of not talking about them, and that he would then, you know, start doing the, these policies once he's in power. It is often in campaigning, you don't agree with another candidate and then, you know, draw his or her policies into absurd caricatures of that. Shkoro did gain some new votes by doing that. But then at the same time, I think he also mobilized other people for Tomasevic, who said, maybe I'm not for Tomasevic, but I definitely now want to prevent Shkoro. Negative campaigning leads to negative mobilization. The strong part of Mojimo is that they are very strong in really, you know, working with people on the ground. So you have this great mismatch. On one hand, you have great expectations. As you mentioned, this anti-corruption message mm-hmm. resonated well among especially the younger voters. However, having the examples of Budapest, Warsaw, Sarajevo mm-hmm. and Bratislava in mind, do you see some sort of green leftist tendency in the administrations of uh, centralist European capital cities? I think in Warsaw and Budapest, you can also see how, you know, local politics and uh, national politics are intertwined, just like in Croatia, how you can challenge national politics through the capital city. But in most countries, the capital city tends to be, you know, more center-left because of its population. The question is, you know, which kind of left? I can see that uh, we have a lot of younger people getting the left. This is something which maybe connects all these cities that you mentioned, including Syria. There has been some you know, generational change. In Croatia specifically, this means that now we have people entering politics and also people voting that are not really affected by some of the big historical issues and themes which used to be important. Now we have a lot of voters who do not really identify that much with the experience, for example, of the Croatian War of Independence, which was very important for all the generations, even my generation, and, you know, the, the whole legacy of socialism. For them, it's so removed from their experience that you cannot really motivate them by any messages about that. You know, they don't care. If you see young people in Croatia voting for the green left, it does not mean that they are pro-socialist or that they are pro-Yugoslav. They don't care about Yugoslavia. They don't know anything about Tito. Tito is just some you know, old grumpy man from the past. They want to debate about climate change. You know, They are very much shaped by this um, global popular culture, which is shaped by social media. And this is what also helps such parties gain momentum. Yeah, it's very interesting to see how the chains of uh, history are getting weaker and weaker as time yeah. goes by. Now let's move to the seashore split. Mm-hmm. Uh, in Croatia's second largest city, both liberal and left-wing parties have traditionally been strong. The vote in split saw a victory for a physicist Ivica Puljak from the relatively new Centar party, who came first with around 57% of the vote ahead of uh, Vica Mihanovic from uh, HDZ. What can we expect from Centar? And uh, do you see any chance they would coordinate their actions somehow with Mojemo in Zagreb? As opposed to Zagreb, uh, that used to have the same mayor for 20 years, split ever since the democratic transition of 1990. They have had, you know, each four years in another person in the mayoral office and often also the parties changed. But here in the campaign, why Puljak won? Puljak uh, was maybe not the strongest candidate, but he also organized this sort of anti-corruption coalition. His party is relatively new, although he and his wife, who is who is also a member of that party, but she's in the national parliament, they have been around for some time now, but this was their big success because on the one hand, 
he played into this idea that he was, um, you know, a more cultural, intellectual candidate than uh, Mihanovic. Pulyak, he studied physics in Paris, while Mihanovic, he has a PhD in maritime uh, building and in economics. But this PhD of his was then very controversial. It was poorly written and sometimes also, you know, direct translations from English, not really quoted. And uh, where on the other hand, you had Pulyak who said, no, I'm a top scientist, you know, he's one one of the most cited scientists in Croatia. He could also you know, profit from the, the fact that many people in Split were tired of these old politicians. He was seen as something refreshing. His party lacks a majority, and he will need to have a majority with many different partners. Now they have agreed, but I'm not really sure if this majority will hold for four years. Because he has to hold a majority with the Social Democrats, mm-hmm. with Mojimo, and Mojimo in Split has former members of his party. So, so that is a bit problematic. And uh, also one independent list and even Most. So Most is another contender on the center right, which is also sort of economically liberal, uh, very much for decentralization and more, you know, Christian conservatives. So for Pulyak, it will be quite difficult. I'm not really sure how much he can coordinate with Mojimo because, you know, okay, Zagreb and Split can, you know, cooperate the cities, but um, in the parliament, you know, his wife sits uh, with, with other, you know, liberals in the center group, and then Mojimo has their own parliamentary group. Uh, sometimes they do vote together, you know, as opposition, sometimes they don't. The center is much more economically liberal and, you know, classically liberal mm-hmm. than Mojimo, which is on the green left. In Split, okay, Pulyak has one advantage over Tomasevic. Although there were many scandals with the former government, still the financial situation is much more stable. So in Split, the former government uh, has actually left, you know, the books in pretty good shape. So in that sense, for Pulyak, it's much easier. And now, you know, with the pandemic sort of going to its end and maybe this tourist season again, you know, bringing in new revenue to Split. But at the same time, you know, he has a problem of this very fragmented majority supporting him. Mm-hmm. Tomasevic does not have to worry about that, but Tomasevic has a bigger city to run, to deal with many, you know, leftover people from the former administration, which might, you know, maybe work against him. So you said that the political situation is complex in Split, mm-hmm. but e- economically it's more stable. What about the third big city of Croatia? Let's provide a brief insight to the political landscape in Rijeka. After 21 years, the Social Democrat Boyko Obersnel did not run in the Adriatic seaport town. Rijeka is an old center-left bastion. The Social Democratic Party's candidate, Marko Filipovic, came first. But in general, the elections revealed a decline for SDP. The independent candidate Davor Stimac won more than 45% of the vote. Do you think that the SDP will stop losing ground in Rijeka? Filipovic, he was already deputy mayor, so he has experience. He has a way of communicating with, with both opponents and citizens, which is maybe more agreeable than his predecessor. But then again, despite him, we can really see, you know, a downward trend for the Social Democrats in Vieca. Even now, the Social Democrats also lack a majority in the city council, although it's pretty comfortable because they need some support of smaller parties. One is a small regionalist party, a youth group, and again, uh, a few seats that Mojimo uh, won in Rijeka as well, and then they will support uh, the, the Social Democratic mayor, just like the Social Democrats will support the Mojimo majority in, in Zagreb. One of the problems which was recent for Rijeka is that Rijeka was just before the pandemic declared European culture capital. And this project was, you know, partially, of course, thwarted by the pandemic. But also there were lots of corruption scandals about, you know, embezzlement of money. And this has had a negative impact on the reputation of the city government, but also uh, of the cultural institutions which were which were leading this project of the cultural capital. And these institutions were usually left-leaning. And now, you know, they have been under great scrutiny from centrist and right-wing opposition. And yes, you mentioned Stimac. Stimac was head of the main county hospital in Rijeka. He gained support from many different voters, uh, not just on the right, but also with many centrist voters. And he was endorsed by this center party. So I'm not really sure that Vieka will uh, change during these four years. I think Filipovic will now stay in power. You know, we won't see early elections. But in four years, if 
they don't change something dramatically, I think the Social Democrats might even lose this stronghold. It has been their biggest stronghold, actually, because that's the one big city that they never lost power. Finally, let's analyze a bit the elections outcome in Croatia's uh, fourth largest city, Osijek, that has a Hungarian ethnic minority population of around 2%. The center of Slavonia region is historically a right-wing stronghold. Of the four major Croatian cities, only Osijek was won by the ruling HDZ. Ivan Radic won uh, 63% of the vote. His opponent, like in Zagreb, was a far-right candidate, supported by the Homeland Movement and the conservative populist Most Party. How do you think Skoro's defeat in Zagreb will affect the Homeland Movement's positions in East Croatia? Skoro and the Homeland Movement, uh, one of their goals is to be a strong and credible and more authentic right-wing alternative to HDZ. When he ran for the mayor of Zagreb, it was more to mobilize people around that issue. And uh, it was then for him an opportunity to mobilize against the Green Left candidate than to actually win the mayorship. He was not really interested in the mayorship that much. His strongest base is in the eastern part of the country. He was born and raised in Osijek. He used to be also an unsuccessful candidate for mayor of Osijek a long time ago for HDZ. And now HDZ has finally won uh, Osijek for the first time. For them, it was a big thing. So the, the lost split which was a big defeat for them, but then they could symbolically compensate with Osi. Osi has also, like Split, seen many different city governments with many uh, complicated post-coalition agreements with going from left to right, etc. On the one hand, on the, on the other hand, we can really say that it was the nicest to watch this campaign as compared to, you know, Zagreb. And even in Split, in Split, it did turn ugly at some points. But in, in Osijek, it was quite nice. Vukovar is very symbolically important for HDZ. You know, losing Vukovar, although they lost to the current mayor, who used to be their, you know, member, but now, you know, uh, has left and is is uh, working together with Škoro. Because what is happening in Vukovar? The local HDZ still mobilizes around open issues from the war dealing with war crimes, dealing with missing persons, dealing with, with you know, some ethnic conflicts around Vukovar. They think uh, that HDZ should cooperate with the homeland movement. And a lot of people in that part of Croatia, because of war legacy and, you know, all the negative effects of war, uh, are more prone to more, you know, emotionally react to some issues and think that Plenkovic is too mild and too centrist. We could draw somewhat of a parallel. It's not completely... A same parallel, but just like the alternative for Germany, a lot of them said Merkel is becoming a centrist. So people who used to be in the CDU now moved to the alternative for Germany. Uh, a similar thing is happening. So the Homeland Movement is mostly attracting few people, so former HDZ members. And it's also attracting a lot of young people, which is somewhat paradoxical because, as you see, some young people tend to not care about the war and about that legacy, but at the same time, some other young people, depending on on part of the country, can be motivated. Yes, Um, it's very interesting that history is much more present in the everyday life in the east of the country. In the east part of the country, young people will be motivated because they will say, our fathers were in war and we feel their pain, etc. But at the same time, you look at Tomasevic, who is also young, whose father was also in the war, and who is actually on the list of the homeland movement in another city, on the local list, which is also paradoxical, but that happens in Croatia because it's it's a small country of 4 million. So, Mr. Raos, thank you very much for being available to share your most appreciated views on the recent local elections in Croatia. It was a pleasure for us to learn your professional claims and opinion. Thank you again, and uh, I wish you good luck for your future researches. Thank you.